left. I want to know if we could uh, talk about uh, some of the other more exotic, the deepest, darkest secrets at Area 51, and that was what went on at Sam's place and, uh, and House 6. Uh, Brian? You talk about exotic uh, technologies and exotic beverages and things of that sort. The best, uh, best game of liar's dice in town. I, I, I'm, I'm asking that sort of seriously in the sense of what the camaraderie and conditions were at Groom Lake, because I know you hear these stories in the early days. It was pretty grim, I guess, but you, you made the most of it. Frank? Well, I, uh, number one, House 6 was the best bar in town. <laughs> <laughs> and there were, there were several. Uh, I only knew about and House 6. never closed. Yeah, never closed. <laughs> and he said, House 6 was originally designed to be the guest quarters. Somebody came visiting 51, you know, from the agency or something. You had to have a bed somewhere. So we had a place with nobody sleeping in there. And they decided to put a bar in the other side of the thing. Well, that ruined it as guest quarters because <laughs> nobody went to sleep in there. But uh, the house six was a fixture, and uh, I spent my time in there too. Everybody did. It was the only place in town. But other other areas of the camp up there where I didn't go, house six was used by the flyers mostly, okay. the officers and the flyers and the and the Lockheed guys and that kind of thing. We each had different camps. Um, yeah, but uh, there, the the we had no army guys there. <laughs> but uh, uh, several of the contractor bunch, you know, in various places, had their own sort of bar setups, and I didn't go to them, nor were they, nor were they so well known as six. But uh, it got so good that we had a we had a weatherman up there named Willie West, who uh, he was a damn good poet. He really was, and he's written a bunch of stuff. And someday we ought to put all his poetry on the website so everybody can see it and enjoy it. But he wrote one about House 6 that was absolutely perfect. Where's Sam Pizzo? Yeah. Is he here? Well, Mitch Sam probably had to go to bed. But uh, he, he, was up, he was up till noon today. <laughs> but, but anyway, without, without going any further, House 6 was a fixture that was uh, enjoyed by many. Uh, the bar, chief bartender was a guy named Bergeson. He also stocked the thing. So when he came to work up there on Monday morning, his trunk was full of goodies for House 6. But without House 6, we'd have gone and made another one. It would have been a House 7 or somewhere else, I think. <laughs> well, I got a claim. I agree with Frank there. House 6 is a great place. But let me throw a little bit in about some of the athletic facilities that were available up there for people to use. They had a squash court, and uh, there was, some of us played squash. Uh, I can always remember big old Charlie Trapp, one of our, our good athlete, big guy. And we'd have knockdown, drag out squash games in that squash court, tennis courts. We'd get up there. You know, I remember somebody uh, one day, uh, Walt Ray, bless his soul, as other side of the net, and somebody had an easy lob coming over, and he's up in the front, and then he jumps up in the air and throws his hands up in the racket. <laughs> and the other guy on the other side walked the hell out of the ball and hit him right in the belly button. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, the athletic facilities uh, were a good addition to, oh, yeah. you know, Going over hall six and drinking and all that. But, uh, yeah, we have bowling alleys, tennis courts, field, uh, three holes. What are you guys as wives here to tell me these stories? Or? <laughs> hey, I got to throw it this way. We older guys who were there when it was first open didn't have any of that stuff. Yeah. Oh, we had a three-hole golf course. You weren't there. First golf course in the world. You weren't there then. <laughs> Ron, you were going to jump into this as well. Back in the <clears> five, <throat> five, we five, had a, six, had a swimming seven, pool as well. Yeah. We also had a swimming pool. Uh, now these guys tell the story of swimming pool, basketball courts. It's like their wives are all here or something. Oh, yeah. The only thing <laughs> yeah. that I really enjoyed is that I think we had the best food in the in the area. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and if our hourly folks ever felt that the food was getting a little bit below average, they threatened to strike. They'd call Kelly. Next thing you know, we'd have a fresh plane load of cooks coming out from Vegas. So between prime rib night and steak night, and um, I put on a oh, lot God, of weight, I'll tell you. And, and so did, was, so did all the coyotes we, around there. We had fresh pastry every morning at 10 o'clock on a push card, and uh, you could go back for food anytime you wanted. So they took good care of us. 
Uh, Frank, tell about the Lake Mead um, hair sale. Oh, uh, yes. Somebody got a hair that uh, they ought to train the project pilots in the use of uh, uh, parasailing, you know, as a parachute landing training, with a full pressure suit on. <laughs> and I mean, this is nuts. This is crazy. So anyway, they, we, uh, we decided that Lake Mead would be the, the ocean we'd jump into. And uh, they tried to drown Jack Layton, who's over there in the corner, and me. And other guys got by unscathed. They came out of it with their hair on and everything else. But it was really hairy, I thought, uh, parasailing into the lake. And uh, we tried all our private boats to pull the guys up, and we can't do that. So they, they conned the Coast Guard into using one of their fast boats, and that got people up. But they also drug me through the rocks for about 100 yards <laughs> and then tried to drown Leighton. So there's a little to gain on a thing where you kill all the people at home, but I figured they were trying to do that to kill us off so they wouldn't have to pay us. Let me add one thing to that very quickly. Uh, Mel Barbadich, a uh, good friend now deceased, but uh, and the parasailing thing, he's going up and everything's going along really good, and uh, they dump him off. And now these are uh, parachutes that can't be used anymore. They're condemned and all that, so they weren't in the best of shape. Uh, one of these uh, side of the, the, the canopy down by the pilot there, the stitching came apart, and essentially the, the whole thing slipped one way. So uh, he's in the parachute, but he's actually in a tailspin going into the lake at about twice the velocity he normally would be. So they drop him off, and all of a sudden he goes, shoom, like a rocket in the lake. And I said, Mel, 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 where are you? Out there swimming around, trying to find Mel. Well, he went about two-thirds of the way to the bottom of the lake, and he, he finally came up. <laughs> we just about drowned him. <clears throat> Try to slip 